Hello and welcome to Unbroken, the podcast with me, Madeleine Black, where I am speaking to people that I have met along my way, people that have inspired me and I'm sure will inspire you as well. They have overcome adversity and have bounced forward in life and now they're making a difference to other people and I really believe in the power of sharing stories. Today my guest is Emma Slade, but as you will learn later on, she also has another name. She was born in Kent and offered an unconditional place at Cambridge Uni. She was also educated at Goldsmiths in London and the London School of Economics, a highly successful international career in finance. She is a chartered financial analyst and worked as a senior analyst in London, New York, Hong Kong. Following a life-changing visit to Jakarta in Indonesia, where she was held up, held hostage at gunpoint, she discovered in herself a yearning to understand the deeper aspects of what it means to be a human being. She put her financial career on hold and began traveling and exploring yoga and meditation. She qualified as a British Wheel of Yoga instructor in 2003 and has since for over 15 years taught both yoga and meditation deepening her lifelong interest in Buddhism. A chance meeting with a Buddhist Lama on her first visit to Bhutan in 2011 left her to studying, led her to studying Buddhism with this Lama and eventually became the first and only Western woman to be ordained in the Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan as a Buddhist nun. Continuing with her energetic and entrepreneurial spirit, Emma has founded the UK charity Opening Your Heart to Bhutan in 2015. This has built medical and educational facilities to help special needs children in Bhutan. In 2017, she was given a Points of Life Award by the UK Prime Minister in recognition of her exceptional volunteering. Her first book, Set Free, was published in 2017 in April and details her inspirational story. Welcome, Emma, to my show. So lovely to have you here. How are you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very good. Yes, yes. It's a long introduction. It makes it me feel quite old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you know, I look to cut stuff out, but they, I don't want to cut any of it. It's all important. So because my show is called Unbroken, the very first question I ask all of my guests is what does that word unbroken mean to you? It's a tricky one because um, everything is continually changing, yeah. actually. It's not a question of broken or unbroken actually it's not on those polar ends of this of the spectrum everything is continually changing uh, reforming re-emerging uh, so i'm not sure if i would use the words broken or unbroken i would just say it's a continual process of change that's with everything with our bodies with our minds with what we look at is the place we are everything is just continually changing yep I, I would agree with that before you became an ordained nun the only western woman uh life was very different I, i've read your book set free which i really enjoyed and thank you so much humor in it actually it was very funny to feel you in that book but yeah. your life was very different you were high heels you know, suits, working as this analyst, you know, high-flying businesswoman. Can you take us back to what life was like then? Yeah, I mean, it was very amazing in, in some ways. You know, it wasn't that I didn't like doing that. I'm a very energetic person. I'm a very analytical person. I like to inquire into the nature of what is going on. What is happening here? Or what is the truth of a situation? And actually, as you, as you said, I was employed to be analytical, to look at companies and situations in economics and try to understand them well and see what the heart of the matter was. So I think you can see in some ways no different from being a Buddhist mm -hmm. nun in the sense of inquiring into the nature of things. What is the truth of things, right? So in that way, I see no difference in some way. Yeah. It's just that my when I look back at the person that I was very outwardly, you know, ch -ch 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 -ch, lots of screens, lots of high heels, lots of going here, there and everywhere, you know, for me, emotionally, it feels very brittle. Okay. I felt very brittle, very um, fragile in terms of my sense of who I was, um, my values, my core sense of, of, of what mattered to me. 
it feels quite brittle and undeveloped. A little bit like a baby person. Very big head, running around, attending many meetings, but inside very undeveloped. Okay, yeah. so that personal development hadn't really started yet. Yeah, just, you know, like a big head on a stick, really. Mm. Um, and so I sort of look back at that person now, you know, with a lot of fondness, sort of trying their best, doing their very best, in quite a frantic corporate world, uh, but um, just only a little bit of them really there, if you can say, yeah. Yeah, I always think we're doing our best with the tools that we have at the yeah, time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, you know, exactly. And so yeah. I enjoyed that, you know, I enjoyed that time. It was amazing, New York and Hong Kong and making big decisions and meeting very interesting people and, you know, just understanding the world I'd been born into. Mm -hmm. you know you know so but it I'm just pleased it didn't end up being the whole of my life and it could have been the whole of my life for sure you know you could have been I'm sure you could have been interviewing me and heading up investments at Citibank or something right mm -hmm. now with an even bigger suit if you had stayed on that like career path yes but it obviously <laughs> Jakarta was the the catalyst or the mm. changing point can you take us back to that moment as well when you were held up in your hotel room yeah so that moment obviously is very terrifying event mm. where you feel very fragile and unprotected by anything you know uh because your life is held in somebody else's hands and the presence of a gun is something which really focuses the mind i think um and yeah, it looks a very extraordinary event when I look back on it now. Like, it's, I still kind of think, how did that happen? Where did that come from? Because it just seemed to come out of nowhere. You know, I just opened my door to a knock and there he was with the gun. You were going to go for a swim. You had your swimming costume on under your dressing gown, just ready to go down to the hotel pool. And this man appears with a gun in his hand at your door. It's just... It was so shocking. I didn't even have time to breathe. That's what it felt like. Like, you know, I couldn't even take a breath in before the gun was in my chest. He was in, I was on the floor and the door was closed. It was so fast, you know, and, and you haven't like, um, if something's going to come along, maybe we have thought about it. We've prepared for it. So many of our events, we pre-thought, isn't it? <laughs> I could imagine that was going to happen. No, you wouldn't. And, and it's the shock as well that, that plummeted you then later on into your PTSD and the vibration of that shock. But mm. it was what happened afterwards when they kind of showed you that he had been dealt with. And that's really when you felt your compassion for this man. Yes. So they, uh, when I escaped and uh, then all the policemen and the army came in with their guns, etc. And uh, I was running down the corridor at that point. So I just heard everything behind me. But uh, later on, they showed me a picture of him. And, um, you know, seeing the picture of him, he was in his, just in his underpants at that point, slumped against a wall. And there was a lot of blood on the wall behind him, like streaking down. And it was in the room where I'd been, you know, I recognized the wallpaper, you know, I knew that's, that's where it was. And, um, I thought he was probably still alive. He didn't look dead, but obviously um, that was a very difficult photo to see. And I just felt an overwhelming sense of sorrow and compassion, you can say, care. Sorrow and care at the same time, you know, because compassion and suffering, they go hand in hand, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, not only for him, also for me, also for the policemen who were very happy about this photo and just for the whole situation, you know, as if I could just look down at every one of these players involved in this situation, uh, pulled and pushed in different ways. And I just felt a huge kind of compassion for them all. And it didn't feel like a compassion that I was generating. Mm -hmm felt like looking at a situation in a completely different way and I don't think I've ever been able to do it since it really didn't like feel like something that came from my mind uh so enormous was it it was like looking at things from a completely different perspective 
that was a very um, interesting experience to have. Yeah. Yeah, and that really um, made your mind up to leave that industry and you came back to the UK, didn't you? Slowly, I mean, gently, you know, because these seeds had been planted, I think, in, in there are many seeds planted in that whole event, yeah. you know, from the beginning to the, that, seeing that photo. But they took time to come out because I had to, uh, first of all, I had to heal from the experience, which did come back and haunt me quite a lot. And so although that was the trigger point, it wasn't like I, I went from there and the next day I was a Buddhist nun. You know, there were many stages along the way, many reflections, digestions, and then gradually getting to the point of feeling, OK, now I'm ready to make a different decision. I'm going to leave the city. You know, then I'm going to explore yoga. Um, so I discovered you were very good at yoga after having never done it before. You were very bendy and could get into all these positions quite easily, which most people I'm sure will be very jealous. My hips will be screaming at you going, how could you do that? <laughs> yeah, strange, huh? strange, yeah. very strange, but useful because, you know, you do a lot of meditation, sitting down and things. And for a lot of people, if sitting down is not comfortable, then those practices become very difficult. So I was really lucky that way. Yeah. Mm. Now yoga is just the most beautiful thing. I just think it's the most beautiful thing. Every aspect of it is just absolutely wonderful. I, I encourage everybody to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your yoga inquiry, I guess, sent you off all around the world as well, really, didn't it? On different courses, meeting different people. Yeah. Different yeah. Yoga it's a huge subject. You know, yoga is it's thousands of years old. It has so many aspects to it. You could devote your whole life to studying yoga, believe it or not. It's huge. Mm -hmm. And you always were intrigued by Bhutan and you always wanted to go, didn't you? Yeah. From a young age, I'd expressed interest. Um, my my mum said and yeah, I think a lot of people find Bhutan very intriguing. You know, a lot of people feel a sort of strange interest in Bhutan. And I definitely, uh, definitely did. And so, yeah, going to Bhutan was a lifelong... Yeah, what was it like wish. going there for the first time? It was so fresh. You know, the air is so clean and the mountains. I mean, I know you find that in Europe as well, you know, Switzerland or Australia or something, but... Some I mean, part of the Highlands in Scotland, where I am. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Bhutan has this freshness and it has an energy. For me, it has some kind of energy. I say now it's like being attached to my mainframe. Mm -hmm. It just is like putting me in the right socket for the best of me to come out. It just has that effect on me. And there we go. And when you went there for the first time, you were with a couple of friends, you were traveling and you went into a temple and you didn't realize that the man you were speaking to was a Lama. No, I didn't know. So I was with a group of people, including two of my yoga students. And yeah, we walked into this temple high up at Dr. Lava, just under 3000 meters in the Himalayas, you know, the clear uh, Himalayan range, a clear blue, blue sky, really cold. <laughs> It's a lot of warm place, you know. And there was at this kind of angle was this monk, so he's in his robes, quite substantial, not not thin or anything. I think you need a bit of bulk on you to cope mm. with the cold, right? And he had no socks on, you know, his feet were bare. And that's the first thing I saw. And then I looked up at his head and it really looked like it was shining to me. And I I didn't it was a strange thing. And I went over to talk to him and the minute he spoke. I just felt something very extraordinary and it was as if I just would like to hear him speak to me for the rest of my life or something. It was just something very So something amazing resonated happened. deep within you when you yeah. were... Yeah. And then that sent you on this journey really, didn't it, to where you are now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sent me on my journey, but, um, uh, you know, it took a lot of effort yes. um you know you can have these pivotal moments but whether or not you choose to really follow them and do something about it i don't know i mean bear in mind he's in bhutan right and i returned to england and it could have been that it could have been a nice holiday memory but i just couldn't let it go i knew this is very profound for me in my life and and so I worked really hard to return to Bhutan and to begin to study what he suggested I study 
and then eventually you know there's many many practices to do and beginning to learn Tibetan and uh How you know you then because uh, i've heard some mantras in tibetan and it, the sounds we don't even have those sounds so yeah <laughs> it makes these sounds is yeah. deep from within the back of the throat yeah yeah there's a, it's a huge subject i mean it's uh buddhism like yoga it's a massive subject two and a half thousand years old mm -hmm. it's just a huge thing i mean you can boil it down to maybe to a few key points but when you examine it in depth, it's a huge subject. Yeah. And there was one of the other things, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it right, that took you three years to complete. Is that the Gondra? Nungjo. Yeah. So those are the preliminary practices that a, a serious monastic or a serious practitioner would do. So 440,000 practices broken up into four sets of 110,000. And uh, they are done as basic uh, training to turn the mind away from being um, so selfish uh, you can say or um, clinging to yourself is so uh, like all important and uh, to start to bring good qualities into the mind qualities of kindness qualities of patience although I'm not very patient to be honest Madeline I'm still working on that one <laughs> we're all working uh, all working <laughs> towards everything aren't we <laughs> our qualities of devotion quality, all kinds of different qualities in the mind positive qualities which to be honest unless we have a way to train in them probably otherwise they don't really develop very strongly you know, it's a deliberate training of, of the profound and good qualities of the mind. It's like stripping our conditioning, really, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. Me, we I'm, don't realise we've been conditioned, obviously. Well, because, well yes, because we're conditioned. Yeah. So we don't see it until we're out of it. For me, what uh, people that know me know I love the number 44. So when I saw you had 44,000, 100,000 of them, it was like, wow, I love that. Uh, but you had to recite these day in and day out, didn't you? Yeah. You can't have a break. Once you start... A, uh, set of 110,000 you have to do some of that uh, every day that so before the moon comes up you have to on some you know and that's uh, that sounds maybe easy but it's not actually very easy because no, because you know, what people have, aren't aware they might know is you're also a mum you also were yeah. back in the UK looking after your son uh, mm. so you had to fit this all in with you mm. know running your life as well Mm. Yeah, I mean, life when I was doing those preliminary practices did become quite simple. I didn't teach yoga anymore. I basically um, looked after Oscar. Uh, he was at school, mm -hmm. so that was not so tricky. Um, looked after Oscar and did my practice. That was pretty much it. I couldn't really do much more. I hadn't founded the charity at that point. I hadn't written the book yet. Mm -hmm. So in the early days, it was not uh, so complicated but still to uh, raise a child and do everything is still quite you and know were you wearing your robes at this point because oh yeah for sure said to you, you should change your dress didn't he yeah yeah he said that in 2012 actually fairly quickly and um you to check up with your guide your friend over there is that what he means <laughs> <laughs> no i was really taken aback i was mainly taken aback because um because i'd had a child Mm -hmm. you know I didn't think it was possible to be ordained once you'd had a child I thought somehow you're like um a little bit how can you say sort of dirted yes you know I know that sounds strange but um so that's why I didn't suggest it well, I it, never it, suggested it, it had sex obviously yes <laughs> yeah Did you write so, it in the book uh, you know uh yeah yeah so and it's still quite rare to be given the opportunity to be ordained once you've had a child but it does happen mm -hmm. and uh it's just that um yeah it's just made my life i've had to be very energetic and determined to, to do to do everything mm -hmm. and at points i've been away from my son when i've been in bhutan for longer periods and uh he's been with his father etc um, so somehow i've made it work but it has been an aspect of things which i think people probably I don't talk about a lot, to be honest. I keep a little bit private, mm -hmm. and um, but it, it 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 has been, you know. I think if you, to do what I've done, you have to be quite determined. Yes. And so, if I wasn't that determined, and I wasn't that clear about my teachers, and I I wasn't that inspired by Bhutan, 
it probably might have been harder to do what I've done I think you know with bringing up a child on your own as yeah. well what is beautiful in the book is Oscar's opinion of yourself. You know, <laughs> when you first put your robes on, obviously where you live, it's maybe a little bit unusual. Yeah. But mum, you're the happiest mum in the, outside the school picking me up. And it was just beautiful to read that. It was so funny. When he was younger, he used to be uh, very, very proud about me, mm -hmm. you know, because he thought it was very good. And he knew that there was His Holiness the Dalai Lama and, you know, he didn't really get it all, but he kind of, you know, felt it was a really good thing. Now he's nearly 15. Okay. Now he's like embarrassed beyond all measure. Now I can't. But that sounds can, quite a normal 15 with him. Yeah, exactly. I think it would come around. It would be the same, I have to tell you, having had two <laughs> girls. Yeah. But I think, you know, I, I mean, I did write about it in the book. I think that one learns so much that is profound through becoming a parent and a carer for another human being in such a visceral and never ending way. Never ending. Never ending. My so I feel it's been a very useful. Never ending. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really embrace parenthood as a huge spiritual teaching, yeah. to be honest. Um, yeah. yeah. And everything that you do really is to become kinder and to become more compassionate to yourself, to other people. Yeah, very much. I mean, that's been my practice from the beginning. And uh, I think it leads back to that moment in Jakarta and uh, to raise the value placed on kindness, which I didn't myself, I didn't rate as a quality, particularly growing up. But somehow that's been a quality I think that's grown most in me but there are many methods in which to learn how to be kind and compassionate and it's a deep and profound subject it's not as simple as I mean it can be as simple as here can I help you with your bag or mm -hmm. you know can I help you across the road or or you know can I uh, contribute to the charity or something but um actually the 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 power of compassion can completely revolutionize your mind your worldview everything Mm -hmm. I was speaking to another interviewee, a woman called Donna in Australia, who tried to kill herself. She jumped off a bridge, but survived against the odds. It was like 30 meters up. And she has the word hope and she calls it, she says it stands for her help one person every day because it said it, it helps her to be kind and it helps them to receive the kindness. And then it's like the ripple effect. And I, I just thought that was lovely. So she will go out of her way, however she does it silently or, you know, when she would just help one person every day. Yeah, I definitely would always wake up with some feeling of how can I do something good and helpful today? What's, you know, how can I do that? I would say more than just humans, not just humans, yeah. any beings, animals, the plants, the soil, any anything to have the attitude of wishing to be benefiting um, uh, it's not just for humans, in fact, it's for the whole situation. How and we if do you can, on this planet really isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's it. Um, if one can develop the habit of waking up with that feeling of what joy could come from helping some being today, then if you can wake up with that thought, then the day will go better, yeah, you know. Um, and even in these difficult times, it's no different. I know COVID is apparently very different, but even in these difficult times, in fact, even more in these difficult but times. We need kindness even more right now and compassion and being connected and, and all the rest of it. And I have seen so many great moments of kindness actually more than before. It's interesting what this uh, kind of collective experience does to people. Mm. Mm. And you, so you started your charity, Open Your Heart to Bhutan, because you were very touched by some limited lives that children have that you met over in Bhutan. Yeah, especially the children who maybe can't advocate for themselves so easily. Um, you know, if they have some special needs, uh, maybe cerebral palsy, conditions like this. So the charity has been very much about helping them. And I am um, personally very moved by those children. They just absolutely get me. Um, you know, Bhutan is a very emotionally private place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's quite 
vulnerable and sort of private about emotions. Uh, so Ugin always worries when I go to meet some of these children, then a little tear sheds from my eye afterwards. He's always like, Anila, you have to be strong, be strong. And I'm like, I know I am strong, Ugin, but it somehow they really touch my heart. So I stay close to them with the charity. I know everything that's going on. I know everything we're doing. I know lots of the children very uh, well. And because it keeps me really in touch with, I don't know, the heart of, of things for me, yeah. And there was a moment in the book where you're almost torn, you know, you're going down this path to becoming a nun and then you could potentially take over a charity and start, you know, being busy again. And you think, well, I've left that life behind. And yeah. so how do you balance it all? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> life is very different for me now, to, you know, than it was maybe three or four years ago. Right. So now I have to be much more disciplined with my time because otherwise there are worldly events of all kinds, which are well-intentioned uh, to help others in lots of different ways could take up a lot of my time, too much of my time. So for instance, now in January, just coming the whole month, I'm just doing practice and philosophical and Tibetan study. So what I have to do is I have to block out times in my diary and just tell everybody, nope, you're gonna have to do it without me that month because otherwise I've realized a mixing after a while can become quite, quite difficult. So I tend to have very clear times when I'm not available and then when I am available, then I'm like a whirlwind, <laughs> you know, getting things done. It's in both worlds, really, at some times. Yeah, I think until Oscar is older, I think it'll be like that. Once Oscar is older, then I think um, I will probably be far more um, uh, in retreat or concentrating on teaching or um, translating Tibetan texts, etc., etc., etc. I think life will become a little bit more monochrome once Oscar is older, um, uh, because the time I can spend living in monastic settings at the moment is more limited because of him, and I've had to come to terms with that. So does that, that mean living in Bhutan permanently one day? Uh, I think it means living in more clearly monastic settings or retreat settings, uh, whether it's in Bhutan or not, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, so, um, right now you're a mum as well. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, yeah. But it'll all, you know, it'll all unfold uh, as it's meant to, I'm sure. You know? Yeah, I, I kind of trust that life does that for us as well, that we just, if we can go with the flow, then it unfolds as it's meant to be. So if anyone's listening right now, um, do you have any advice or, or any tips that you would leave with people on, on kindness, compassion, or, you know, how to develop that? Oh, such a big subject. I think, first of all, I'd say that if, you know, I reflect on this time that we've all been through in the last year. And I think it's worth asking yourself at this point, what can you rely on? because this year has been a year where a lot of the things that we thought we could rely on um, have been pulled away, isn't it? Yeah. I think kindness is something that you can rely on in any circumstances that you can rely on kindness. Uh, and if you can feel as if you, what you can rely on is your solid ground, something that's known then you can rely on it, right? I think it's good to think of kindness in that way. Ah, oh, this is something which will never let me down. Mm -hmm. I can rely on kindness. It's, you know, like it's the ground foundation. It's not the icing on the top of the cake. It's the ground foundation, right? So that, first of all, I think that, I think when you do uh, acts of kindness, however big, however small, please take a moment to savor how that feels in your heart. Don't dismiss the goodness and the joy that's come to you from it. Mm -hmm. It's important to realize that compassion and permanent happiness are linked. Please notice that. Support yourself, like pat yourself on the back. It doesn't mean other people have to know what you've done, but inside you need to feel that warmth and that joy from being compassionate and helping others. You know? that, that is also very important. And the root of compassion, of course, is love. Yeah. 
And so um, when we study compassion, we ask, how does it arise? And it arrives, arises because we care. We care for uh, ourselves, our family, our friends, other beings, the birds, the animals. It's our natural state to love and care. And because we care, it's our natural state to wish to take away the suffering of those beings. Mm -hmm. This is our natural state. Anything else is an unnatural confusion. But it's about stripping away all those layers that get put on top of us by different experiences and conditioning and all the rest of it. It's, it's coming back to our natural state is, is the journey really, isn't it? Yeah, but it does require courage. I think your even your podcast has the word courage in it, doesn't it? Yeah. To realise our natural state requires courage. How crazy is that? But it's true. I know it is. But um, so when you were ordained, you were given a new name, weren't you? Annie means none. Doesn't none. It? Yes. None. Yeah. Yeah. And your yeah. name now is. So my ordained name is Bema, which is Lotus, and Deki, which means blissfully happy blissfully happy lotus mm -hmm. and so um you know that's what i'm aiming for <laughs> it is beautiful my one of my tattoos that i have is of a massive lotus on my thigh because my mum always says to me that out of the mud grows the flower and you are definitely blossoming uh, <laughs> perfect perfect name for you <laughs> It was just very funny, I think, if you remember from the book, so the Rinpoche who named me in Bhutan, uh, he didn't know that my name was Emma, mm -hmm. right? He, did, he didn't know that. He just met me as a Westerner, isn't it? And then he decided to call me Pema. And Lama just thought it was just so hilarious that I went from Emma to Pema. Mm -hmm. And he just couldn't stop laughing about it. It was just the funniest thing. I just think he thought it was just hilarious as if, you know, you've been born in the West and you nearly had the right name. You just needed that extra P from Bhutan, you know, Emma to Pema. It was just a very funny moment. It is funny and it's very poignant really as well, isn't it? There wasn't much change needed. Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So I said to my mum, you did a good job, mum. Yeah. You nearly got there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Emma, Pema, thank you so much for... Oh, it's doing. my pleasure. Absolutely. My pleasure. Well done for all you're doing. You just a joy to be with. I could just sit in your energy all day. <laughs> very, I feel very calm with you. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, keep going. You too. Bye. Bye. Unbroken, the podcast with Madeline Black, playing now on all the main platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher for Android, Google Podcasts. Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, and here. Play Unbroken, the podcast, with Madeline Black.